All right, so FAQ Show is well known for interviewing guests from the business world. But today we are going to take a slightly different approach and maybe my t-shirt has already given it away. If you recognize this logo here, right? This is a crypto trading platform, Runo. They're one of the largest crypto exchanges in Malaysia. And today with me, we have the country manager and the general manager of APAC, Mr. Aaron Tang with us today. Welcome to the show. Hi Frankie, thanks for having me. Before you became the general manager in Luno, right? You were involved in the more traditional kind of businesses. You work at Petronas, you work at Weatherford, you know, these are all yeah, the typical businesses that people would want to be in, right? But how did you get yourself involved in crypto subsequently? Yeah, it's a bit of a long story. So I spent most of my career in the oil and gas industry. I used to be a field engineer. I used to go offshore, onshore, uh, work on oil rigs and stuff like that. But somewhere in the middle of my career, I decided you know, to try something new. I think I've always been quite interested to try new things. And then I, I used to actually work in a social enterprise. I was doing some leadership training work. Uh, but roughly around the same time, I actually heard about this new invention called Bitcoin. And I've always been interested in personal finance, investments and things like that. And with Bitcoin, I was curious and quite surprised because for a long time, I was trying to figure out, you know, what is this thing? How can it exist online and still have a lot of value? And then I ultimately, I decided to try and buy a little bit of Bitcoin. And Luno was the platform that I actually used to, to buy Bitcoin back then. Back then. Uh, when yeah. was this? Uh? This was 2016. 2016? <laughs> yeah, 2016. Wow, quite a long time ago. Yeah. So I bought a bit of Bitcoin on Luno. And then after that, I figured out that, you know, this is something like super interesting. I read more about it. And so happened that uh, I write a blog in my free time and I wrote about Bitcoin and crypto. And so happened the guys at Luno back at that point, mm. they were asking like, hey, we actually have an opening, would you be interested to apply? And here we are, like, uh, I think it's been six years plus now. Right. So your blog <laughs> got you the job to go into crypto? I, I wouldn't say my blog got me the job, but it was like part of the process right, in, part in, of actually, the process. Yeah, in, right. in getting into crypto, yeah. Right. Well, speaking about your blog, you write a blog called Mr. Stingy. Yep. What inspired you to start the blog? I've always had this creative side of me that I wanted to express. Mm. And back then, 10 years ago, it's like quite different because, you know, even photo sharing or video is not as, as prevalent as it is today. So back then, what you did was you, you write a blog, lah, right? Mm. So that was what I started doing. And um, there's a lot of things that I try and put into that blog. So whether it's personal finances, career, and so on. But over time, I, I became more well-known for my money-related articles. Lah. Right. Yeah. Do, for better or for worse, yeah. Do you have a business plan for Mr. Stingy? Not really. Not, not really. really. Yeah. I mean, I do it more for fun and right. hopefully to, to bring some good ideas and art into the world. Maybe I'll write a book one day, but uh, right. that's about cool, it. Cool, cool. <laughs> I will look forward to your personal finance book. And, thank you, thank you. And see you. how I can make money from it. <laughs> <laughs> Coming back to Luno, right? Many people are not familiar with Luno. Uh, could you explain briefly what the platform actually does? Right. So Luno is a very simple and convenient platform for people who want to buy, sell, learn or store their digital assets. Mm. So for example, you can imagine it as a very user-friendly and very educational platform for people who want to get involved in crypto digital assets. We call it digital assets because that's the formal technical name given mm. by the regulators in Malaysia. But basically, if you want to buy Bitcoin in Malaysia today, there's no easier way or better way to use Luno. And uh, we are not just talking about Bitcoin, right? you have other assets listed on the platform as well. Until today, how many coins do you have on yeah, the we have 11 assets listed on the platform as of now. Okay. So all the major coins that you can imagine. So Bitcoin is, of course, the most well-known. Ethereum is also quite well-known. And then we have coins, for example, like Solana. Solana has been doing quite well. So a lot mm. of people are talking about it as well. From what I can see is uh, they are all the big cap crypto projects that are listed on Luno Exchange. But what stopped you from listing all the other coins? Because if you look at those overseas platform, right, they have like thousands of coins listed there. So why don't Luno do the same to get more business? Yeah, it's a bit of a nuanced answer. So first of all, definitely we do recognize that mm. people want more options, right? So there's definitely an effort there to increase our number of offerings and coins mm. over time. But I think the other angle to that is we are a regulated business in Malaysia. And because we are regulated, we have a higher level of care and diligence for our customers. Now, what that means is basically we can't just list any random coin because the fear is that you know, people may simply invest in these coins and let's say the coin is not a well-established one, let's say something 
bad happens to the coin, people might actually end up burning themselves and actually losing their investments and so on. Mm. So we are very careful in the types of digital assets and cryptos that we list on our platform. That's why, as you mentioned, we started with the the major Mm. caps. You'll see all our coins are probably top 10, top 20 in Mm. the world today. But again, we are looking to expand further on, but we will always be very careful with what kind of coins we list. Okay. If there's a potential coin that you want to list on the platform, do you need to get approval from the Securities Commission or it's entirely up to your discretion C? Every coin needs approval by the Securities Commission. Mm. So you can imagine it is a a bit of a process because I think they also being the regulators, they want to make sure that the coins that are listed, uh, for example, not some scammy kind Mm. of uh, project and so on. So yeah, they're also trying to do their best to protect the the investors. Okay, speaking about protection, right? Because ultimately crypto is still a very new thing to the world and we don't know what could go wrong. But let's say if something goes wrong to Ethereum and Ethereum is listed on Luno, from the platform's perspective and also the regulations perspective, how do you all work together to ensure that the users are protected? I think it it comes from multiple angles, right? So I think the first thing we've already spoken about, because we only choose the ones that we do a lot of due diligence on. Mm. So first of all, I think the biggest threat is more or less eliminated. Mm. In the sense that these projects are established projects. It's not like some dodgy, scammy project that uh, no one has heard of, right? So I think that eliminates a, a big portion of the risk. I think the second part of it is in terms of the regulations, how they protect the customers. This is in terms of, for example, our procedures, our processes of how we store the assets and so on. Mm. So people who use the platform, they can be sure that, you know, I won't suddenly like lose my crypto to some weird occurrence Mm. or the platform has some issues, right? So I think the regulators will try and cover that. And we are, as a player, we also have to make sure we we have a safe and responsible platform. But I think the third thing is in terms of whether a coin appreciates in value Mm -hmm. or can lose value. I think that one is based on, on market forces. Mm, market forces. Yeah. Correct. So in other words, we will do our best, our utmost due diligence. Okay. But sometimes the performance of a coin, whether it goes up or down, that is beyond our control. Mm. As in all investments, actually. Mm. Just want to understand the mechanics in the trading process, right? If I bought a coin from Luno, it appears on my wallet. Yes. Uh, but ultimately, where does this coin sit? Is it in Luno's balance sheet or is it with a custodian or some sort? So basically, when, whenever you buy a coin, it can sit in either Luno's sheet or on a custodian sheet Okay. because we actually use what we call multi-layered storage. So for example, a certain percentage of coins are mm. stored with us because we need to move coins fast in and out. But also a larger percentage of those coins are actually sitting with our custodian. So okay. they are stored in very high safety, secure environment. Okay, so if I understand it correctly, you would keep a small portion of assets with you to facilitate fast transactions, but most of the assets will be kept in a custodian. Yes. So in the event that something goes wrong with Luno, yeah. Yeah. at least a big portion of the asset is still secured with a third party. Yes. So it is just yes. that small portion that may be affected. Yes. And I'm sure you have all the contingency plans to actually recover all these coins to the users, right? Yeah. So it, it is basically what we call a, a multi-layered storage mm. in the sense that the, the principle is always you don't want like all your coins sitting like in one location, right? Mm. So you tend to to spread it out uh, mm. across multiple layers or multiple forms of storage mm. just to do, do risk management, basically. Okay. And uh, because we are talking about digital assets, so I think one of the biggest investment that you may need to do is cybersecurity. You're right. How good is the cybersecurity measures in Luno? We firmly believe that we are industry leading in terms of cybersecurity. So that means that For example, we've already spoken about the multi-layer kind of Mm. storage. We also use industry-leading custodians. So meaning that these are the custodians used by all the top crypto exchanges in the world, for example. Mm. We also have a very sophisticated cybersecurity team, Mm. meaning that we do checks from internal, but we also get penetration tests, meaning that we get other firms to try and like penetrate the Luno uh, cybersecurity. And then we work together with these firms. Uh, Okay, they they tell us uh, we need to improve A, B, C or so Mm. on. But I think perhaps the most uh, important part that I want to bring up is we recently launched something called proof of reserves. So proof of reserves, it means that somebody, an external party, which is a trusted party, has actually come and evaluate and review all the crypto holdings that we have. Okay. So they can basically tell the world that, okay, I can sign. Frankie has, uh, maybe you store 
one Bitcoin in Luno. Mm. I can 100% tell you that yes, Frankie's one Bitcoin is with Luno. It's not like somebody has made up a number somewhere. Oh, okay. So proof of reserve is actually a security measure. I always thought it's a new kind of mining because, <laughs> because we heard yeah. about proof of work proof of stake yeah. and then now you have proof of reserve so yeah. I thought proof of reserve is like oh if you can prove that you have reserve in a particular organization then you yeah. get reward or uh, something so it's not that kind no no it's okay. it's more of like a, it's, it's an audit it's, it's, it's somewhat we can't use the word audit because okay. I think you have like certain kind of I don't know requirements before you can call it audit mm. but what we can say is this company that we use is an audit firm. They basically do financial audits for people normally, mm. right? But they have expanded their services to also review crypto platforms, uh, reserves and holdings. Mm. And we're very happy to say that uh, we, we have launched this very recently. So anyone can go and check on their Luna website. Oh, that actually that whatever I see in my e-wallet, mm. actually that a third party has verified that yes, it does okay. belong to me. Yeah. Okay, cool. Interesting. Just uh, bring back some history a bit. When did Luno started in Malaysia? So we actually started in Malaysia back in 2016, all the way back, right? Uh, but I would say that for today's discussion and purposes, Luno in its current form, which is the regulated, the one that has mm. been given the approval by the authorities, we started in actually October 2019. 2019. So yep. three years after operation, you got your license. Huh? Yep. yep. Uh, okay. And how far has Luno gone from uh, 2016 until today? I'm sure in terms of user base, yep. it has grown tremendously, right? Yep. Uh, what is the growth like from back then until now? So when we started back in 2016, it was obviously from basically zero, right? Today, we are very proud to say we have more than 840,000 users. 840,000? Yeah, 840,000. Okay. So I haven't checked the latest numbers. It could be maybe 850, 860 now, okay. but definitely more than 840,000. So Malaysian users themselves, our Malaysian customers have mm. done like a, a huge number of transactions. I believe that number is like in the 65 million or something, number of transactions. That okay, 65 million transactions. Yeah. And do you know usually what is the typical ticket size for each of the transaction? Um, I don't know exactly, but it is not a huge amount. Oh, Basically, uh, like a DCA approach, every month 100 ringgit, that kind of. Um, I would say maybe it's in the hundreds or maybe a thousand plus kind of thing, the average size. Mm. But we must remember the average size is skewed by some of the, the whales who are doing maybe larger numbers. I understand. Yeah, but when you average out, it's probably in the hundreds or thousand plus the, right. the average transaction. Now, 840,000, 850,000 users. Yeah. I think that number is even larger than the conventional stock market user. Where I'm coming from is that, do you think crypto investment in Malaysia today has surpassed the conventional kind of asset classes? I would say no, mm. actually. So I think CDS, if you look at the stock market, CDS probably has maybe somewhere around 2.5 to 3 million users. Of course, it's okay. not with one platform, yeah. but it's, it's spread out across all the brokers and investment banks. Uh, but no, I, I think we're really at, at just the, the beginning of it. Because if we look at investment in Malaysia, it is predominantly, I think, still driven by fixed deposit, unit trust, mm. mutual fund, and so on. So yeah, I, I feel like there's a long way to go. But the encouraging sign is people are definitely very interested to get into digital assets, Bitcoin, and, and not just to invest, right, but to learn. And actually, you know, some people even make careers out of uh, Bitcoin mm. and crypto. It is definitely a very interesting industry to a start off, like where it grew from 2016 all the way until today, right? I want to talk a little bit about staking, mm. right? Today, you can stake Ethereum and uh, you can also stake Cardano. Yep. Now, I understand that to lease a coin, you need SE approval. What about all these other kind of products, like staking, for example? Do you also need approval to do that kind of services? Yeah, so maybe like, let me share the, the story of how we got uh, staking launched in mm. Malaysia. So definitely, we also wrote to the Securities Commission because we saw a lot of demand from our customers here in Malaysia. Mm. And then we had already launched staking in one of our markets overseas. And we saw a lot of demand and, and people were very happy with it as well. So basically, we wrote to the Securities Commission and, uh, and we discussed, we, we spoke to them. Uh, they had a lot of questions like, how does this work? How are you ensuring that uh, the users are kept secure and so mm. on? And I think ultimately at the end of the process, they were quite satisfied with what we committed to doing. Mm. And then that's when they said, um, yeah, it's okay for you guys to, to launch staking. So can we expect more staking products going forward? Yeah, we definitely want to get as many staking products as mm. possible, given the market has said that, you know, we want this kind of yield generation or 
you know, basically I want to put my crypto and get some rewards for, mm. for putting my crypto in Luno. Yeah. So it's like a FD like that, like, right? I mean, it's <laughs> kind of the same principle, yeah. right? I, I put it there and I, I get rewarded for, yeah. for putting okay. it. Okay. So using bank products as an example to mimic what Crypto World is doing, one of the most exciting thing that I personally look forward to is a crypto card. Mm. So I can deposit my crypto assets into the card and then I can spend it in the retail store or uh, whatnot. But I understand that the procedure to get that card is very, very difficult. Can you share how is it like in that experience in Malaysia if you are looking into that? And also how far are we from getting that card to Malaysia? Sure. So maybe an, another nuanced answer, right? <laughs> So as a crypto enthusiast, it's actually a very, very nice idea to me, right? Mm. Like for example, if you had a Luno branded card mm. and then you'd be able to, to spend and then earn some rewards. I really like that idea. Mm. But I think in terms of uh, implementation, we might need to be a bit practical in terms of uh, how quickly or you know how it might be launched. Because I do understand that currently the regulators in Malaysia, they see digital assets as a form of investment, mm. right? So you can invest in it and then you, you're you able to get some gains from it. You'll even be able to get some rewards in it. Now, in terms of using digital asset crypto as a form of payment, I think that is a little bit uncertain whether mm. the authorities or whether uh, Bank Nagara mm -hmm. or the, the regulators are quite comfortable with it. So yeah, I think that's where we are at the moment. I, I think maybe just to clarify, Luno is currently not seriously in the... It's not on the roadmap for mm. now. So maybe one day in the future, but I think we do need some clarity from regulators before we embark on this mm. uh, cards. Okay. The short answer is we may not be able to see it in the foreseeable future. Lah. Yep. This yep. could be something far further yep. down in the further pipeline. Further down the road, yeah. Maybe okay. medium term. Yeah, we'll mm. see. Okay. This is a question for myself. <laughs> okay. All right. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, I use a lot of Luno. I Thank use you. Luno to trade a lot. Now, thinking back, the first time I used Luno, it was quite uh, seamless where you have a button that says buy Bitcoin. So that's what I did. I bought Bitcoin and then I got my Bitcoin. After the transaction, I noticed that you have another tab which is called the exchange where you can also buy and sell Bitcoin but at a much better pricing. So why do you have these two kinds of method for you to do transactions on the platform? Wouldn't that be very confusing to the users. Yeah, so I think just to, maybe for the audience, right? So in the Luno app, there's there's two features. One, we call it the instant or simple buy function. So it's okay. as Frankie described, you just press one button, you get a quote for how much you mm. want to buy the Bitcoin, and then you buy, right? Mm. Now, the fees for that is higher than versus the exchange mode. Now, mm. the exchange mode is a bit more similar to maybe what you would see on a normal stockbroking app mm. because you have all the charts you have the candlesticks you have the order book you know yes. you, can, you can see what prices people are trading uh, buying and selling at when we looked at our customer base we realized that some people actually just want the, the really really very simple one right mm. I'll just click buy, I see the quote, and I, I straight away buy. Mm. It's simple and fast. Whereas some people, they actually like the, the bells and whistles. Maybe for more sophisticated uh, investors, they actually want to look at the charts, they want to place their orders and so on. Mm. So we basically offer both methods because, again, it's, I, I think, slightly different demographics. Lah. Mm. Our worry is if we just give one interface, some people may find that it's a bit too confusing or, you know, I, I, I don't want to bother about all these features. Right, right. On the other hand, if you just give the simplified interface, people mm. will say that, oh, I want to be able to queue my orders. I want mm. to be able to set price limits and so on. Okay, so I also downloaded a few other exchanges approved by securities commissions once, uh, of course. And I noticed one thing very striking is that in your order book, the depth of the market is a lot better. The liquidity is much better compared to other platforms. Is it simply because you have 840,000 customers and everybody just jump into Luno platform to provide that liquidity? Or is it something that you do behind, you have some mechanism to make sure that whenever people want to do transaction, you make sure there's enough liquidity in the market? So I think it's more of the former. Most of the liquidity that you see on the order book is completely organic. Completely organic. Oh, completely organic. Most of it. Okay. okay. So meaning that most of it is basically Malaysian users trading among themselves. Uh -huh. So uh, maybe just again to, to clarify for the audience, when you trade on Luno, you're basically trading against 
other people in Malaysia. Yeah, it's a yeah. community kind of trading. Uh, yes. It's not an exchange trading yeah. like Busa Malaysia. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you're basically buying and selling versus maybe Another somebody user. else in, in, yeah. in, in Malaysia, yeah. right? We do try and help with uh, basically market makers to try and help support the liquidity. But again, it's not a huge amount of like uh, market making going on. Right? Mm-hmm. Most of it is actually uh, organic by the Malaysians themselves. But I'm sure you also make extra revenue when you do market making, right? Our market making is basically to help support the liquidity. When we do market making uh, a little bit of ourselves and a little bit with uh, maybe partners, it is not intended to to drive a profit to us. Yeah. Oh, I mean, okay. we, we don't want to lose money, of course. That, right. that is clear. But it's not intended to be a, a big profit generating right. for us. Okay. Well, for context, if you don't know what's market making, basically, if the trading of a particular asset has very little people are participating in it, then the market maker will come in and provide liquidity into the buy and the sell so that it makes the quote a lot more accurate to the real market. The price won't be distorted, put it that way. Yeah. Some of the exchanges like Coinbase, <laughs> they are listed, right? Yep. On the NASDAQ and all that. And uh, since, since, since you're largest in Malaysia and I, and I guess that you make quite a lot of money over the years, does Luno Malaysia have planned to actually go listing as well? Specifically in Malaysia, because we are part of the overall Luno group. So yep. there's no plans for Luno Malaysia to, for example, spin off and you know get listed on Bursa or something mm. like that. Lah. We will definitely follow the, the overall group level, which is mm. basically our Luno based in the UK. So for mm. example, maybe if Luno decides to go for listing in say three years on UK stock exchange or the US stock exchange, then I think we'll just follow along for the ride. Lah. Okay, so you will be part of the big Luno group. Yep. Yeah. yep. And then uh, Malaysia is just a small portion of it. Lah. Well, we're not a small portion because we are one of the major markets. Oh, uh, you're one of the major yeah, markets we are in the Luno of, ecosystem. Yes, definitely. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. So, so yeah. are you in the top three or top yeah, five yeah, kind, yeah. Of, definitely. Uh, kind of transaction? Definitely. Oh, really? Yeah. Interesting. So, Malaysians, thank you very much. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Uh, because you're the general manager in the Asia-Pacific region, right? Yep. So within your scope of work, Yep. Can you help me to rank what are the top three countries that are using Luno today? Yep. So I currently look after Malaysia, Indonesia and Australia. Okay. So among the, the markets here, definitely Malaysia is our largest market. Wow. I uh, <laughs> didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> now, Luno may be the most well-known crypto trading platform in Malaysia. But in general, there are still many, many other exchanges out there, right? So what is your future plan in, say, the next three to five years to at least defend this position? Or is there a plan to say that, hey, I want to be like Coinbase one day? I think our immediate focus, uh, definitely in this like one year, Frankie, is that we want to get to a level where we feel that we have enough crypto, digital assets for, for people. I think mm. we've still been super conservative right now. In Malaysia, there's 11. Mm. So probably we need to get to maybe 21st, 30, get to a, a more breadth of digital assets. Then we want to bring other solutions. For example, mm. staking was a good launch this year. Mm. But can we bring staking to many, many other coins as well? Mm. So I think that's the first two objectives. Uh, basically to bring the level of product deeper. Because I think currently we're still uh, not as deep as we want to be. Then apart from that, I think it will definitely be a matter of you know, what markets do we want to expand further to within Asia and so mm. on. Uh, but yeah, we're very ambitious and I think uh, the next few years are going to be very interesting. Okay, cool. Now, one last question before I let you go. There are a lot of people who want to jump on the bandwagon on uh, crypto space, but they find that to learn about crypto is something very technical and something very hard to do. What advice can you give to these people? So I think the first piece of advice is if you want some material to learn about crypto in a very, very simplified manner, you can actually go to Luno. So Luno has an education center. It's completely free, right? Oh. Either you use the website okay. or even if you use the app, you don't even have to sign up for an account. You can just go and, and scroll and learn about uh, crypto in very, very simplified way. La. And by the way, in Malaysia, it's both in English and Bahasa. So even mm. if you want to read in Bahasa, it's, it's completely fine. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, I think the unique thing about crypto, uh, digital assets, is you can actually start investing from as low as one ringgit, right? One ringgit is the minimum buy. So sometimes if you don't actually try with a little bit of money, mm. it gets a bit harder to learn, mm. right? So I, I don't know what is a, a cup of coffee to some people. Maybe it's five ringgit, maybe 10 ringgit, maybe 15 ringgit, those <laughs> slightly higher, right? But maybe you can just take that coffee money, put a little bit, 
give it a try. And then I feel that you are quite incentivized to learn about it. Okay. it. It was the same for me because I always read about Bitcoin from a far distance. Mm. I can never really understand. But the moment you actually put some of your money to try, mm. then suddenly you are forcing yourself, I have to learn, I have to understand what I'm buying, right? Mm. So I think that would be also a useful thing. But of course, don't put a huge amount of money, right? The first time. Mm. But you can start with five, ten ringgit, something like yeah. that. And I think people will be amazed at what they find out. Yeah, That's the best way to start investing actually yeah. but just now you mentioned you can invest in crypto from as low as one ringgit but what about the transaction fee and all that wouldn't that add up to more than one ringgit then at the end you don't get anything oh uh, no so basically if you use the simplified buy sell interface okay. it is transaction fee is two percent so if you're 2%. buying one ringgit so two, you two charge cent. two cents a oh, okay, okay. so okay. it's it's again very very super right affordable. so there's no minimum fee or whatnot you just pay that two percent on yes. whatever value that you are buying correct interesting uh, but anyway uh, we have come to the end of the show uh, thank you so much Aaron thanks for your thank time you, um, I learned a little bit more about Luno and I think after this session I'm a little bit more confident of uh, continue to use Luno as my first choice of uh, digital asset investment thank so, you Frankie yeah, yeah. All the best to you. Thanks. Nice to see you. And All the best to hope you to too. see you again. Thank you. Right. And if you like this episode, don't forget to subscribe, like, and uh, turn on the bell notification. You can also check us out on Spotify if you want to listen to this content on a podcast banner. So see you guys next time. Check out. <laughs>